All right. Uh, our theme of scripture is uh, uh, Genesis chapter 50, the last chapter of Genesis, verse 20, uh, where, um, well, we're going to see the context of this later. But you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Let's read that scripture together. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So we're coming, uh, we're in the dog days of summer. We're kind of, uh, we're still going in our series, Are We There Yet? We did water and vacations. We did mountain vacations. Now we're doing family reunions. And, um, and in each of the messages for this summer, we're kind of starting in the middle of the story. And I'm, I'm kind of conscious of the fact that uh, some of us, maybe many of us, don't know the beginning of the story, the whole story arc. We kind of dive into the story in the middle. So I don't want us to get lost, but I want us to catch us up a little bit um, of the story so we're not lost. So check this out. There's this series of videos uh, called The Bible Project, bibleproject.com. If you've never been on that website, highly recommend it to you. Um, it's a ton, of res a ton of videos. I don't even know how they made them all. And resources to help us understand the scriptures, understand what's, what's in the Bible on a variety of topics. I, you wouldn't even have time to watch all the videos on bibleproject.com. I don't know how they made them all. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it's really pretty good, really good, actually. So I want to show you a 30-second clip that uh, talks about, introduces the topic of the second half of the book of Genesis, which is going to get us started on today's family reunion story. The whole second half of Genesis is about this one family. And so you have, you have Abraham, and then he has his son Isaac, who has Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. And to each generation, God renews his promise to bless them and all nations through them. So because of this promise to use this family to rescue the world, it's pretty easy to read these stories as examples of how to be a good person. But actually, for the most part, this family is totally dysfunctional. Totally dysfunctional. Does that sound like a family you know? I don't know. So we got Abraham married to Sarah, and they have a son, Isaac. And last week, uh, that was the family we focused on, was Isaac's family. Isaac and his two sons, uh, Isaac and Rebecca, they had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And Isaac, he has two sons, Esau and Jacob, and it seems like things are going pretty good. But Jacob, the younger brother, wants the family's inheritance, which belongs to Esau, the older brother. So he devises a plan where he's going to steal it from his father, Isaac, who at this point in the story is now old and blind. Which who does that? Horrible stealing from your blind father. Yeah, and then he just takes off. So our family reunion story last week was after Jacob took off, then 20 years later he comes back uh, and had a reunion with his brother Esau. That's last Sunday. If you missed it, go check it out online. And today we're going to head to the next generation. So Jacob and his sons and their family reunion. So Jacob had 12 sons by four different women, not consecutively, but all at the same time. Uh, so it's a recipe for disaster. So kids, don't try it at home, all right? Um, one woman, Rachel, of course, is more beautiful than the rest. And for that reason, and apparently other reasons also, Jacob loves her more than the rest of his wives, which is a mess, and that creates more messes. So Jacob goes on from there to have 12 sons, big family. But Jacob loves his 11th son, Joseph, way more than all the others. And so he gives him the special technicolor dream coat, and his brothers, because of this, come to hate him. So much so that they plan on killing him. But they don't. They instead just sell him as a slave down in Egypt. Now, while in Egypt, through this crazy series of events, Joseph goes from being in a prison cell to becoming the second in command there. And so later on, the, the whole Middle East falls into this food shortage. And Joseph's brothers, they come down to Egypt looking for food. All right, so that compacted a lot of stuff. So I want to just expand it a little bit there. Um, to, so we can get to the point of the reunion of, jo of Joseph and his brothers. So um, Jacob, the dad, loved Rachel, one of his wives, more than the rest. And um, Rachel had two kids. She had Joseph. So that's why Jacob loves Joseph more than the rest is because he loves his wife, Rachel, more than the rest. And then she also had a second son. Rachel had a second son, Benjamin. That was Jacob, uh, Joseph's only full blood brother was Benjamin. And Rachel died during childbirth, giving birth to young Benjamin. And that was the end of that. So now the dad has really two favorite sons. He has Joseph and Benjamin, but Benjamin's just a, a baby. 
So as the video said, the, old, the brothers hated Joseph because of the way his dad treated Joseph differently than all the rest. Benjamin apparently wasn't an issue. Maybe he was just too little or something and it wasn't a challenge or whatever. But long story short, so Joseph had these dreams. And in these dreams, he saw himself ruling over his brothers. If you have a dream about you ruling over your siblings, I'll give you a hint. Don't share it with them. Okay, that's not a good idea. So they finally got this chance to kill him, and they were going to murder him, but then some traders came along and they decided, you know, we can get a twofer here. We can sell him into slavery, get rid of him that way, and we can get cash out of it. This is a great, great plan. So Joseph winds up a slave in Egypt, like the video said, and he winds up through a series of things happening. He winds up in prison. And when you're, when you're in Egyptian prison, uh, your life is as good as over. Like, you may as well be dead if you're in Egyptian prison. He's dead, basically. But this thing leads to that thing, and that thing leads to this thing, and one thing leads to another. And, he, and it turns out Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has this dream. And Joseph is able to interpret dreams. And so he interprets the dream for Pharaoh. And he is raised up to become uh, second in command of all of Egypt, the minister of finance in Egypt. Uh, and that's where the family reunion comes in as this famine happens. This famine happens, and the family, Joseph's family, needs food. So here we go. When Jacob, the dad, learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so we may live and not die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers, so only 10, because they left Benjamin home, 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brothers, with the other because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Jacob's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan all over. Now Joseph was the governor of the land of Egypt, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him, just like the dream, with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them, obviously in, in Egyptian language. Where do you come from, he said. From the land of Canaan, they said, to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. It's like, you can tell, this is going to be like a real scene of drama right here. So, um, as you're Joseph... And your brothers show up after 20 years, after having sold you into slavery. What is Joseph thinking as they show up? So turn to the person next to you and tell them what you think Joseph's thinking. Okay, I'm serious. Like, this is your part. I'm going to get a drink of water. Well, we don't really know what Joseph was thinking. The Bible doesn't say what he's thinking, but we know what he does. He toys with them. He accuses them of being spies. And they go back and forth and back and forth. And then they reply. They say to, to Joseph, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest, is the Benjamin, is now with our father. And one is no more, Joseph. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you're spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you're telling the truth. If you're not, as surely as Pharaoh lives, you're spies. And he put them all in prison for three days. Ha! On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go back and take grain for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and you may not die. And this they proceeded to do. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother Joseph. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life and we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. And Reuben said to them, to his brothers, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen, and now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize Joseph could understand them, since he was using an interpreter. And he turned away from them and began to weep. But then he came back and spoke to them. And he had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. 
It's one of the brothers, second oldest brother. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. And after this was done for them, they loaded their grain on the donkeys and left. And that's the end of the first family reunion. It's just so cool. Joseph is just messing with them, and he can understand them, but they can't understand him. It's just cool. It kind of reminds me, it was uh, years ago, about 25 years ago, I was walking the streets of Caracas, Venezuela, and um, I had a bunch of white people with me and one Asian. And uh, so we're walking the streets, and there's a bunch of, you know, girls that look pretty. And so these guys in Venezuela are making lewd, kind of lewd comments about our girl, the girls that are walking along because they think we can't understand them. And we had one guy with us who's a white guy, but he's born in Venezuela, so he knew what's going on. And all of a sudden, he whirls around and starts yelling at them in Spanish. And the, sh the look on their face is just shocked because that that, they thought we couldn't understand. Anyway, it was just funny, priceless. But so Joseph knows, because he hears what they're saying, that his oldest brother Reuben had tried to save him. He now finds that out, that Reuben had tried to save him. So he decides to take the second oldest brother, Simeon, and throw him in an Egyptian jail which is as good as dead, as we said, until they bring Benjamin back because he wants to see Benjamin. He wants to see his full blood brother. It's been 20 years since he saw the little guy. Probably wouldn't even recognize him hardly. Well, so the brothers go back to dad, to Jacob, and this leaves Jacob with a choice. Jacob can either send the brothers back with Benjamin to get Simeon, but he risks losing Benjamin, or he can leave Simeon rot in jail. So what does he decide to do? He decides to let Simeon rot in jail. <laughs> if you were Simeon, how would you feel about that? Pretty fun. But anyway, finally the famine's too much. And so they have to return to get food and Benjamin makes the trip with them because they know they can't get food unless they bring Benjamin. When they arrive, Joseph asked them how they were. And then he said, how's your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? And they replied, your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed down, prostrating themselves before him. And he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son. And he says, is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. After he washed his face, he came out, controlling himself and said, serve the food. I love what happens. They served Joseph by himself, the brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because Egyptians would not eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to Egyptians. The men had been seated in the order of their ages, from the firstborn to the youngest. Joseph picks them out and goes, you sit here, you sit here, you sit, and he orders them according to their ages. It's so cool. And they looked at each other in astonishment. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portions was five times as much as anyone else's. So they feasted and drank freely with him. Now Joseph had gave these instructions to the steward of the house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry, but put each man's silver back in the mouth of his sack. Don't make him pay. And then put my cup, the silver one, the in the mouth of the youngest one's sack, along with the silver for his grain, and they did as Joseph said. And that ends their second family reunion. The, the brothers take off, but they got their silver again back with them, and they have... Joseph's cup. Joseph's got more up his sleeve, obviously. So once they leave, he sends his soldiers out to chase down the brothers and accuse them of stealing Joseph's silver cup. This is what happens. They deny it. And it says, if any of your, the, the brothers say, if any of us, your servants, is found to have that cup, he will die. The rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. They know they don't have the cup. Very well then. The soldier said, uh, whatever's in charge said, let, let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you are free from blame. So each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And at this, they all tore their clothes. They loaded their donkeys, returned to the city. Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in. Judah's one of the other brothers. And they threw themselves to the ground before him. And Joseph said, what is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? What can we say, my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? 
God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now, my Lord's slaves, we ourselves and the one who was found with the cup. Joseph said, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the one who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you, go back to your father in peace. Then Judah went up to him and said, pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. So now if the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy is not there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant, in other words, Judah, guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let me, your servant, remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come on my father. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. And so there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. It was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed his brothers and wept over them. Of course, they're still scared. So Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for our good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And so then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And thus ends the third family reunion. It's, it's one of the best stories in all of Scripture. I shortened it way up. If, you've read this, if you haven't read it, at the end of the book of Genesis, first chapter of the Bible, it's like 12 chapters long. I've shortened it way up for you. But read it today. You'll be thrilled. I've left out a lot of great parts. There's a lot of other good parts to it. But it's wonderful just what I included. And if you've already read it, read it again. It's just a great story. And why, what's so great about the story it's because the story reminds us of Jesus in so many powerful ways. Do you see Jesus in the person of Joseph? Remember how Joseph was sold into slavery and wound up in an, an Egyptian prison. Remember that I said when, when you're in an Egyptian prison, you're as good as dead. You're gone, basically. It's a death sentence. Joseph was humbled. He was humbled so low and yet in those moments, he remained obedient to God, was faithful to God, even to the point of death. And God raised him up and seated him at the right hand of Pharaoh. Does that kind of remind you of somebody? Sound familiar? And at the end of all that, what did he do? He saved the lives of many. Remember our scripture, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Couldn't those words come from the lips of Jesus on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. What is now being done, the saving of many lives. That's what Jesus was essentially saying on the cross. Not only do we see Jesus in, in Joseph and in the story arc of Joseph, but we see Jesus also in the life of Joseph's brother Judah, his brother Judah, the change of heart that Judah had. Judah participated, was going to kill his brother Joseph. He participated in the selling of Joseph into slavery in Egypt. 
And now at the end of the story, we, what do we see Judah doing? We see Judah saying, I will protect Benjamin at the cost of my life. I will give my life. And so when Benjamin's about to be in prison for life, in an Egyptian prison, about to lose his life, what does Judah do? He says, now then, please let your servant, let me remain here as my Lord's slave in place of Benjamin. And let Benjamin return with his brothers. Let him live. He offers up his own life in place of his brother Benjamin. Where he once gladly sacrificed Joseph because he was sick of that teenage guy. Now he gladly sacrifices his own life to save the life of his brother Benjamin. It's an amazing transformation. And it's not the transformation that reminds me of Jesus because Jesus doesn't have that transformation. But the final action of Judah reminds me of Jesus gladly sacrificing his own life to save you, to save all of us. Jesus sacrificed his life to make this family reunion today that we have possible. And guess what? Of all the 12 brothers, Joseph and his 11 brothers, of all those 12 brothers, one of them was Jesus' ancestor was in the line of the Messiah. And it wasn't Reuben, and it wasn't Simeon, and it wasn't Joseph, and it wasn't Benjamin. It was Judah. It's fitting that it was Judah who's Jesus' ancestor. Judah who offers up his life to save the life of Benjamin. The story of Jacob's son's um, family reunion, it's not the greatest story ever told. But it certainly is a picture, a reminder of the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told involves you. Jesus giving his life for you so that you could be part of this family, so that we can have a family reunion every Sunday morning. Let's stand.